find out what you do best, step number one. And step two, do it. Today, life is great. Welcome to KnoxCast, Music on Music. I'm trumpeter, composer, vocalist Knox Summerhour, and this is where the world's top musicians, composers, producers, and industry professionals tell us how they've made their way in the world of music for TV, film, video games, stage, studio, and more. Carl Saunders is the best jazz trumpet player you've never heard, and if you have heard him, as I have, you might just stop at the best. John Williams, Stan Kenton, Benny Goodman, Frank Sinatra, Mel Torme, Tony Bennett, on and on. Carl has performed and or recorded with all of them. Now with four jaw-dropping solo albums of his own, all available on iTunes and elsewhere, he's also focused on recording most, if not all, of the songs he's composed over the years, which are available in his new book entitled New Jazz Standards, available on carlsaunders.com right now. He's become a friend and a musical mentor of mine, so without further ado. So the first question, uh, since you just got back from Las Vegas, I thought it was very appropriate because you've always kind of been back and forth between Vegas and L.A. I was born in Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. I moved to New York when I was, right after I was born, because my mother was singing with her brother's band, my uncle Bobby, Bobby Sherwood, who had some hit records and stuff in the big band era. And from zero to five, I was out on the road with the band, like traveling. And then when I was five years old, my mom got out of the music business to keep me out of it because my whole family was swept up in it. And uh, we moved out to L.A. and moved in with my Aunt Caroline, who was married to the saxophone player that was with Bobby's band, Dave Pell. So Dave Pell became my uncle, too. So then we lived in L.A. from when I was five years old till I was 12. Then I moved to Vegas. But while I was in L.A., we were living partially with Dave Pell and my Aunt Caroline. And when he started the Dave Pell Octet, I used to listen to the record all the time, and that's when I heard Don Fagerquist, who was the trumpet player with Dave Pell Octet. And uh, it inspired me to to play uh, Warm and Beautiful. And uh, I was going to talk about Dave Pell a little later. Um, Your mom was the first singer with the Stan Kenton Orchestra, is that right? Yeah, she had a radio show in Hollywood. And what's her name? Well, her name was Gail Sherwood, but mm-hmm. she she had a radio show in Hollywood, and the two piano players that worked with her was Van Alexander and Stan Kenton. Oh, wow. So when Stan started his band down in Balboa, <clears throat> um, Stan asked my mom to sing with the band till they got somebody steady. So she went down and, and uh, sang with the band. She was the first singer with Stan when he started the band down in Balboa. Now at Olive Garden, when I, when we first time I one of the first times I met you, you and I went to Olive Garden. You probably don't remember this, and you told me the story about when you were being, uh, oh. you were on the road with your mom when you were really young, and right. Stan Kenton's band, and and no, not Stan with my my Bob, oh, Bobby Sherwood. Band. Okay, tell tell us. That. I thought that was really funny. Oh, do you mean yeah? Well, I remember being held you know as a baby, and I looked up at the band, and I liked the trumpets because the. The lights were glistening off of the brass, you know, the lacquer and stuff. And I just noticed it because of that, like the flashing of the light. And you were being rocked in the wings. You yeah. were being mm-hmm. rocked in the wings yeah. by your mom. Mm-hmm. And how old were you at this point? Who knows? Two. I'm, Nobody remembers anything I'm before I'm being they're... held. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah. if evidently I couldn't walk yet. I did want to talk about Dave Pell. Uh, Fred Mills introduced me to Dave Pell long before I met you. It was like... 10 years before I moved to Los Angeles and uh, I immediately fell in love with them and of course Don Figuerquist solo I'd never heard quite a crafty solo in that way you know, before hearing him I, I wanted to bring this up because I've talked about it with a few people through the years some people challenge the notion that there's a difference between West and East Coast jazz and the New, well, New York style of you know what tends to be more uh, edgy I guess and the West Coast sound, and to me, that, that that group epitomizes the West Coast sound. I don't know if they defined it, but talk a little bit about that, and if you yeah, think there's a difference. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a, you know, 
justifiable observation. Um, <clears throat> the West Coast jazz is uh, more, you could say, polite and clean, you know, which I don't mind, you know. But I like hard burning rhythm, mm -hmm. you know, the hard burning rhythm. If the, I don't like the polite rhythm like a polite drummer and a polite bass player. But I mean, you know, Fagerquist was so clean, like Carl Fontana, he was so clean and uh, perfect, you know, like... Um, so uh, what uh, what are, is your opinion about what role that group played in defining the sound of West Coast jazz? Well, it was just part of the West Coast jazz. There was a lot of groups like that, you know, they, you know, Marty Page, uh, you know, did a lot of... Who arranged for them, too, I think. He arranged a lot of charts for the octet, and so did Shorty, and... Uh, Even Johnny Williams. And John Williams, yeah, and Bill Holman. And, and all of those guys have their own bands and wrote for their own bands, so they, they kind of... Um, they were writing for a lot of people. Um, just the way they wrote kind of... Um, define the West Coast uh, way of uh, approaching jazz. This is Carl's version of Chopin's Minute Waltz. Vegas was popping with a, with a lot of work and the shows, and they had the best trombone players in the world in that town. I'm talking about jazz trombone players, mm -hmm. not just section guys. Uh, they had Carl Fontana, and they had Jimmy Gwen, who was with the Al Boletto Sextet, and Jimmy Gwen was a fabulous jazz player. Uh, nowadays, uh, for my money, Scott Whitfield is the mm -hmm. greatest jazz trombone player of all time. He blows them all away of all time. All time. Fontana, Rosalino, give anybody. He, he blow ev them all away. That's my opinion. And uh, my opinion is pretty good. I know. And I just <laughs> saw him the other day at, at, at a rehearsal. I played with him at a rehearsal. Um, I get lucky to sit behind him mm -hmm. um, and hear him just do what he does and plays trombone like it's a, you know, soprano trombone. <laughs> right, yeah, he's got high chops, he's got bebop, he's he's very knowledgeable with the chord changes, he writes, he's one of the top musicians we have on the planet. 
plus the greatest jazz trombone player of all time. I keep saying that. Because I, yeah. I spent 30 years with Carl Fontana, you know, and so I don't say that lightly. Right, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, show, the, I'll show Scott the tape, and, and he'll be very happy you said that. <laughs> Although I'm sure you've told he, him to his he, face. He knows. Yeah. Um, when, when you went back to, when you moved to Las Vegas, uh, you were in high school, you started playing with the Stan Kenton Band. Is that right? When I got out of high school, uh, well, Stan Stan came to Las Vegas, and we were all Stan Kenton freaks, you know, in high school. We were listening to Stan Kenton. I used to listen to Stan Kenton, Billy Mays band, uh, the High Lows, Four Freshmen, um, and uh, the Terry Gibbs band was just starting up, you know, that dream band with Al Porcino playing. And so we were listening to that type of stuff, and then all of a sudden... Stan Kenton comes to Las Vegas at the in the lounge at the Riviera, and so me and my friend, uh, trumpet player in high school, we we were out of high school, but we went down every, about every night and stand outside the lounge and listen to Stan's band play, and we'd puff on cigarettes, you know, to make the security guards think we're older, but I think they were hip to us. <laughs> and then my mom knew Stan from the old days, you know, when. Stan worked for her, and she she went down and sang with the band. So we went. And this is twenty years later, or whatever. From that, she went down, and talked to Stan, and and said the kid's got a good ear, and he'll be a good player someday. Why don't you give him a shot? So Stan gave me an audition, and I went down and uh, um, uh, got up on the bandstand, and like I did, you know, I never had a jazz. Uh, there was no jazz program in my high school. In other words, it was just marching band, concert band, and pep band. The closest thing to a jazz band was the pep band for the basketball right, games. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so when I got up on the stand with Stan Kenton's band, I was green. I was a green recruit, you know. <laughs> and I was sitting on the edge of the section and playing and just hanging in there best I can. And, and, uh, and then Stan motioned something to Dalton Smith, who was the lead trumpet player, and he passed a lead part down to me. <laughs> and uh, I started gagging immediately. And uh, it was on Walking Shoes, the Jerry Mulligan tune chart. And <clears throat> so we played it, and I got through it fairly well because I knew it from the record. So Stan thought I could read, you know. All right, so you're just reciting it. So uh, after the audition, Stan said you can have the first opening in the trumpet section or you can leave next week with the band playing Melophonium, which that was the Melophonium band at the time. So what's a kid to do? I said, yeah, I'd leave, go out playing Melophonium. And uh, there you go. And I went out and played about a year and a half playing Melophonium with Stan's band. It was kind of a, a college in a way, you know. Growing up today and you wanted to play jazz, if you were 17 or 18 years old, what would you be doing, you think, with your talent set? Well, I don't know what I'd be doing, but I can suggest anyone that was interested. I mean, someone that's... Um, someone's got to be interested in it and have a passion for it and willing to pay some dues and and uh, dedicate themselves to it, which is, you know, I guess you do that in any genre, I mean, any uh, type of work mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, but um, if you listen to the right people, you know, like if you're, I mean, I'm a trumpet player, so I would say, Listen to, you know, uh, Dizzy Gillespie uh, back in the late 40s when he, before his cheeks started puffing, because that's when he was playing his best. And I don't think anybody's ever played any better than that. Um, you know, you listen to him play that stuff that he was playing back in the late 40s with Bird and stuff like, 
it's uh, phenomenal. He was, you know, I don't think anybody's touched him since, you know. I mean, he never could follow himself after his cheeks started puffing, you know, because his cheeks would have to fill up before the air hit the mouthpiece. And, you know, it was like a delayed reaction thing. And, you know, he wasn't, I mean, he played good in the 50s and the 60s. But, you know, when his cheeks started puffing, it it, uh, it kind of hampered him, his total thing that he had going uh, but Freddie Hubbard is you know was the uh, heavyweight champion of jazz trumpet you know you listen to him play his early Freddie sort of late Freddie he started trying to play high notes and squealing around and I don't know what happened to him yeah. you know and then he started playing kind of commercial records to try to make money you know like Herbie Hancock did you know he started playing little kind of semi fusiony type beats like the watermelon man and all that stuff and herbie wanted to like make some money instead of just being a starving artist jazz artist and being a purist but i don't want to do that i mean i wouldn't do i mean uh, yeah, yeah. I, i'd rather just be a purist and not uh not be rich whenever christmas comes around i'm always reminded that everybody loves jazz i mean maybe not hardcore jazz but all the Christmas songs are very harmonically complex compared to anything that's going on in pop music today. And they're, you know, uh, even though it's not. Do you mean you Santa know, Claus is coming to no, town I, and Rudolph no, I mean, the Red Nosed Reindeer? I mean, you know, some of those Andy Williams songs and uh, and Johnny Mathis. You look at uh, you know, Nat King Cole recorded a lot of Christmas songs and they're, yeah. they're pretty harmonically complex. And I just yeah. wonder how we get. How do we get the rest I mean, of the world? mean, chestnuts roasting on an open fire. I mean. Yeah, compared to what would be written today, it's it's more harmonically hit. And it's like closer to the American songbook, except you only listen to them two weeks of a year. Right, so how do we get the, the general public to pay attention to even that level of, of jazz uh, the rest of the year? <clears throat> well, I think it's the responsibility of the disc jockeys in the, in the record uh, the the radio stations because they they take the the theory that like the newspapers give the public what they want the public doesn't know what they want the public what you if you play stuff over and over and over and over the public will like it eventually so my theory is get the disc jockeys the radio stations to get off their butts and start playing good more progressive music, swinging stuff, good jazz, and uh, uh, good pop stuff. You know, Tony Bennett, uh, mm-hmm. Peggy Lee, Frank Sinatra, Joe Beam, uh, musical things, you know, and jazz, and start playing it over and over. And people will, will, pretty soon they'll start tapping their foot, and pretty soon they'll start like it. And I also think that the reason that jazz is a minority market is because no one's swinging and put in that pocket. You know, that rock and roll's got a pocket. Boom, boom, ping, boom, 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 ping, tick, boom, boom, ping. You can feel it, you know. I mean, I don't necessarily like it, but I can feel the beat where with jazz, you've got to feel the beat. Duke Ellington said, it don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing, and he was right. And I think the reason people don't like jazz is because it's not swinging and they're not playing together and they're not grooving and they're not putting a pocket on that that beat that jazz beat this is carl playing his tune nigeria
When you compose a tune, which comes to you first, the melody, harmony, is it a groove? Or or do you does do you have like this is a separate question but related, do you have an external source of inspiration like nature or painting or something like that? Uh, very rarely do I um, have an external source. I write music for the sake of music. Mm -hmm. I don't write for a tree out front or, a, or you know. I've written some tunes for uh, lost relationships with chicks mm -hmm. or something. I've, I've named some tunes after some chicks and and then I've named some tunes after people like kind of a tribute to them. But um, is it after the tune is already written, or before? Uh, sometimes, sometimes I'll write it for the sake, you know. It's sometimes, but um, uh, as far as the where the cup comes first, the changes of the chords of both, you know. Sometimes um, uh, a lot when I first started writing, I'd just like get a set of chord changes and play them because I play bass lines and comp and get a comping feel of the changes mm -hmm. and kind of little get a little set of changes then i'll write the changes out and then i'll put a melody to them mm -hmm. or sometimes uh if i hear a melody i sure uh, while i'm hearing the melody i also hear the changes so there's no writing the changes that much unless you you know run into some weird turnaround or something you want to find some sort of an artistic way of to you know worming your way through the the progressions but uh yeah both you know sometimes i'll i'll uh, just hear changes and write the changes out and then write a melody or sometimes i'll hear a melody and i'll write the melody down and then put changes to it but usually the melody usually uh suggests the changes you know unless you're gonna like go real weird or far out what uh is your theory about practicing jazz and uh how a student should go about it. Well, I've always thought that uh, practicing jazz was a uh, like a oxymoron, meaning you can't practice jazz. You know, you practice your horn, you practice your scales, you practice the fundamentals of your instrument, and then if you have jazz in you, then go out and play it. Practicing jazz, um, I always thought was was I didn't like that. You know, it just didn't sit well with me. But now, um, I'm starting to change my mind a little bit. I never also don't like, uh, um, I never liked the concept of uh, copying solos out and writing them out. You're like delving into someone's mind, you know, someone's sacred scrolls. You know, mm -hmm. it's kind of a invasion of privacy in a way. And that's how I always thought it. But now I'm starting to change my mind a little bit on that too. Uh, I've written these this thing called a jazzercise, which is um, instead of practicing in a book and you're looking at the notes and you're going and and then you come back the next day and those notes are still there so you go unless you turn the page you know and then those notes are always been there so those notes are always there with my jazzer size it's just a set of chord changes so every uh, so every time you play it it's different because you're playing jazz so the jazzercise is the first jazzercise, jazzercise one, is a set of chord changes, the minor chord going to resolving to up a fourth to the to the seven chord, uh, to I mean to a, a seven chord, right? And it starts on a bar of C minor seven and then resolves the next bar to F7. Then the next bar, you take that F7 and minor that and make it F minor 7 to B flat 7. That's how high the moon. And then the next, you take the next bar and you take that B flat 7, you minor that. And then you go B flat minor 7 to E flat, and then E flat minor to A flat, and then A flat minor. And you just go through that uh, cycle of minor 7s to 7s, which is what's the basis of jazz. If you look at uh, if someone passes you a part that's got hieroglyphics on it, meaning chord changes, yeah. uh, you're going to see 
B flat minor seven to E flat seven to, you know, you're going to see those resolutions all the time. So this is the basis of jazz. So the jazzer size, and in the and it's a tune. It's like it turns around like. Uh, uh, it's like a tune without end. If you blow C minor 7 to F7, then F minor 7 to B flat, B flat minor 7 to E flat, and you just go around the horn playing all the minor 7s to 7s in all the keys, and uh, and then you'll then you'll do it again, and you'll do it different. But you're just getting acquainted with, the, with getting your fingers and your eyes on the minor 7s to 7s. And then Jazzercise 2 is C minor 7 for a bar... To F7 for a bar to B flat major seven, so it resolves to a major seven, which right. the first jazzer size didn't. You get the one, and then you take that B flat major seven and you minor that. And if you go through all the all the way around to the end, you'll only do it'll only do six chords. So then you got to go to jazzer size two B, which is up a half a step, and you go to B minor. You know, down a half a step or whatever, and B minor to E, and that gets the rest of the keys. But you're going to a major seven, so it's resolving C minor seven to F seven to a major seven, which you see in jazz chord changes all the time. In tunes, you see that all the time. They're just basic progressions, and those that's the basis of jazz. And if you practice those. Uh, you're you're not playing the same notes all the time. You're playing different every time you play through it. It's different because you're, you know, you can't remember what you played. And we we have all our licks, and you'll repeat your licks, but you'll repeat them in different places and at different times and different speeds and different rhythms. Your your latest two projects have been recording your own tunes with uh, Scott Whitfield, who we talked about, and Sam Most. <laughs> Sam, you know, at my house in Vegas, I've got like a box of reel-to-reels of Sam playing in Vegas in my front room back in the 70s and, and great stuff. But, you know, finally, uh, and then I made some CDs, homemade CDs in the, through the 90s with Sam um, with good rhythm sections. I mean, I, I was playing drums and Christian was Christian Jacobs playing piano and Kevin Axt and Dave Stone and different bass players uh, and uh, recorded about six, seven CDs, full CDs of all my tunes of Sam playing them on baritone, clarinet, uh, alto flute and flute. And he brings the tunes to life. He was so knowledgeable of the chord changes and he could go through hard chord changes and just make it sound so simple. And so I decided to, he was 82, and I decided to take him in the studio and do do a record for real. And we did 12 of my tunes that he picked. And uh, then we did the overdubs over at my house, Sam's solos and heads and stuff. And we finished recording t two weeks before he died. So it was like a premonition to get the record done. And they were all my tunes, and I got a book out called New Jazz Standards. So I called the album Sam Most New Jazz Standards, and it's on uh, Summit Records. And um, then uh, I recorded Scott Whitfield, and it's uh, called Scott Whitfield New Jazz Standards Volume 2. Right. 
And right now... Are they available on, online or just on your website? Summit Records. Summit Records. And um, uh, in March, uh, I'm releasing Volume 3, which is all done and ready to go. And it's it's going to be Roger Kellaway Trio. And he picked uh, 12 tunes and... And it's going to be New Jazz, uh, Roger Kellaway, New Jazz Standards, Volume 3. And I have already recorded Larry Kuntz, oh, yeah. a great guitar player, with Josh Nelson, uh, Joe LaBarbera, and Tom Warrington. And that's going to be uh, Larry Kuntz, New Jazz Standards, Volume 4. So that's that's what I'm doing at the moment, you know, and then that's all from the book, New Jazz Standards, which so, is yeah, a yeah. book that I, I want published. To you can get that on your website, right? Yeah. The New Jazz Standards. And it's printed in concert, B-flat, E-flat, and bass clef. And you got, uh, tell me, you know, the, on the very front of the cover, the John Williams wrote you a, a nice blurb. Right. A nice promotional uh, uh, testimonial. Right. So tell me how that came about. Well, um, I went back uh, to Tanglewood, uh, I think in 04, and we played the John Williams, Shelley Mann, My Fair Lady album. Oh, wow. And, uh, you know, it's like a big band and then a small group, so I was in the small group. John's brother, Don, has been a close friend of mine for quite a few years and he lived around the corner from me in Vegas and now he lives around the corner from me here. <laughs> Don and Williams Don, is a percussionist, uh, for those that didn't know. I didn't know before you told me about him that he's a percussionist, a studio percussionist yeah. here. Okay, so I knew Don's mother, who was also John's mother, uh, because I'd go over and hang out with Don. And mm -hmm. So Don's and John's mother died so John, uh, John's mother's favorite tune is uh, Can't Get Started. So John asked me to come play Can't Get Started at the funeral. Wow. Was that after you had recorded it on your album or before? Oh, be way before. Way yeah. before. And so I went over there with Tom Garvin, piano player, and, and I, played, I played it for, you know, live at the, at the church, you know. So... You know that's why I knew John like from that, from those uh, things, and uh, uh, so when I put the book out, I um, uh, I asked John to. I gave him a book and asked him to give me a blurb, and he did. And I got a blurb from Bill Holman and Johnny, Johnny Mandel. Johnny Mandel, I saw that. Yeah. So can't, I was either going to try for the Pope next, but <laughs> well, you got the Pope of film music. That's yeah, sure. that's true. Yeah. Tell me how important writing is to you. Um, you know, when you say write, um, I mean, I never studied music, really. I just was natural at it. And like I said, I was a bad student, so I never wanted to learn anything. I always thought I knew it all <laughs> already. You might yeah. have. So I, I had a concept in my head, like, um, uh, about, you know, music and... Um, uh, you know, I could make music. You know, I mean, when I was in high, when I was in high school, uh, I was out playing basketball, and everybody else was practicing. The trumpet players and band, they were practicing, taking lessons, and playing the Carnival of Venice and all those things. I never could do that, but because I never practiced or took lessons. But when I got back into band, I was still better than them in the way that I could, I had the concept of the music and I could make music. And uh, that's what I say when I do, do clinics now. I'll tell the kids, I'm going to talk to you today about what we do after we learn our instruments. I'm not going to talk about the, 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 the mechanics or the fundamentals mm -hmm. of playing the instrument. I'm talking to you about after we learn how to play our instrument, now what? And what that is, is making music. So it's like a natural thing. So uh, what was your question again? <laughs> <laughs> this is Carl playing Larry Dominello's composition, First Gift.
folks would, I think, really be uh, excited to know that you're you are in the Family Guy Orchestra with Seth MacFarlane's show Family Guy and the other show American Dad. Talk a little bit about uh, how fun that is. Well, I mean, it's you know, it's they just do these little cues, you know, right. a whole bunch of little do do ba do ba do ba do ba do. And then, horn. and then, da, ba, ba, da, ba, da, ba, ba, da, you know, little things like that. You know, occasionally there's some difficult stuff to play. You know, but mainly it's kind of it easy. You know, flugelhorn and trumpet. And is that uh, usually at Fox or at Fox all the time? And usually it's Larry Hall and Wayne Bergeron and I, and uh, they make it. And it's only three trumpets, four trombones, and about thirty-five strings over there. And uh, Full four French horns, and it's like a big studio, big orchestra. And they do it all at the same time, simultaneous. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Session, yeah. I'm they sure, don't break yeah. them up. Yeah, uh, Walter Murphy does all the composing and arranging. The final question I have for you, unless you have anything else that's burning a hole in the in the microphone, in there. my mind. <laughs> What's one piece of advice you wish you'd been given when you were young about a career? in music as a freelance musician one piece of advice you wish you'd you'd gotten I used to tell people years ago uh, kind of uh, this philosophy bag I used to say there's two steps to success step number one find out what you do best now finding out what you do best is kind of kind of weird because people you look around, people aren't doing what they do best. They're doing what their family did or what they got into by accident or, you know, they don't really, they're not really doing what they do best, but they're doing it for a living now and and that's what they do. What they're doing is what they don't do best. Mm -hmm. So my uh, um, advice was uh, find out what you do best, step number one, and step two, do it. Well, Thank you for letting me do this. Well, thank you for coming all the way from Culver City <laughs> from your new house. KnoxCast is brought to you by yours truly. I got more great interviews lined up with some really prolific and fantastic friends, so please subscribe to KnoxCast on iTunes, Stitcher, and follow me on Twitter at Trumpet Knox for podcast updates. Are by my side with me. Stay tuned and stay musical. Today.